So brothers and sisters, uh, our reading today is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. This is our New Testament reading. It's widely known, as you probably know, as the resurrection chapter. And it's here that the Apostle Paul shares with the Corinthian Ecclesia what he describes is of first importance. That's how the NIV translates it. Uh, He says this is of first importance, truly a first principle. And namely, that was that Jesus died for our sins and was raised to life again. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, I'll just turn the chapter up. We'll be looking at uh, several passages in this chapter today. And um, and here it is. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, we'll start in the third verse. For what I received, Paul writes, I passed on to you as of first importance that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Peter and then to the twelve, and after that he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. And what Paul does in this chapter is he carefully He provides a carefully reasoned explanation of why the future resurrection is critical for Christian faith. And the way he does this is he he lists ten serious consequences for failing to accept the evidence about the resurrection. Look at verse 12, for example. But if it is preached that Christ has if it is if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say there is no resurrection of the dead? Speaking about a future resurrection here. Verse 13. If there's no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless. And so is your faith. And so what we see here are the first two of these ten reasons. Well, there are ten consequences of not believing in the, first, in, in the resurrection. The first is that the preaching of the apostles was a sham. And the second was that your faith, the thing that you've committed your life to, is useless. So he goes on and he, in, the, in the middle of these ten consequences, he pauses and he adds a, almost like a parenthetical argument, a digression, if you will. And he shows where this future resurrection fits in God's overall plan. So again, the big picture is that Paul is showing these ten consequences for not believing the resurrection. As he goes through these, he stops and he's got this digression. And the digression is, is it's as though he's stepping back. And he's showing the grand plan of God and where the resurrection fits thematically in this grand plan. Brother Michael Ashton, he was the former editor of the Christadelphian magazine, describes this passage that we'll be looking at uh, as a passage of epic grandeur. And it's in this section um, that I'd like to focus our attention this morning, this particular parenthetical, this digression that Paul has. And the passage is found in verses 20 through 28. So I'd like to uh, read that for you now, because this is where we'll be focusing our attention this morning. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ will all be made alive. But each in his own turn. Christ the firstfruits, then when he comes, those who belong to him. Then the end will come when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father after he has destroyed all dominion, authority, and power. 
For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death, for he's put everything under his feet. Now when it says that everything has been put under him, it's clear that this does not include God himself who put everything under Christ. When he has done this, then the Son himself will be made subject to him who put everything under him, so that God may be all in all. So again, this digression, this parenthetical argument in verses 20 to 28, is designed to give a big picture view of the timing or the time frame of the resurrection and where it fits in God's overall plan. Paul begins by describing Jesus' own resurrection as a first fruits. Then he explains that those who die while belonging to Christ will be raised in their own turn. And finally, he concludes with the accomplishment of God's master plan when God will be all in all. So we'll be exploring these three things, brothers and sisters. One, the first fruits. Two, the phrase in order, then. He says, those who die belonging to Christ will be raised in their own turn. We're going to look at that expression, in their own turn or in their own order. And finally, we'll look at that time when God will be all in all. Okay? That's our goal. So let's start by thinking about the death of Christ. Can you imagine the, the pangs of regret the pangs of fear that probably pulsed through the minds of the chief priests and the Jewish elders as Jesus hung dying on the cross. These are the men that caused the crowd to turn against Jesus. These are the men who encouraged the Romans to crucify this man. What do you think they were thinking when darkness hung over the land for three hours at the height of daytime. Remember that during Jesus' crucifixion. You know, earlier in the year in, North Amer in much of North America, we experienced a total solar eclipse. You remember that? For those along the, the path of, to of uh, Totality, the path of totality. I thought I'd never forget that phrase. We heard it so much during the Eclipse news broadcast. Well, for those that were in that path of totality, the sun disappeared for between three and a half minutes and four minutes, 18 seconds. That's how long the sun disappeared. Even here in Massachusetts, where the eclipse was about 90% of totality, Remember what happened? The temperatures dropped. The birds went crazy. Flowers closed up. The crickets chirped like it was nighttime. Now, what was it like in Jerusalem that day? The sun disappeared not for three minutes, but for three hours, from noon until 3 p.m., and it wasn't just the three hours of darkness that I think would have given the Jewish leadership pause and, and pangs of, of fear that day. See, after Jesus cried out and yielded up his spirit, the Gospels tell us that there was a mighty earthquake that broke open the tombs and tore the 60-foot-high temple veil from top to bottom. Matthew reports that many of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised temporarily to life again. So, do you think these miraculous events would have caused the wicked Jewish leadership to have second thoughts about crucifying Jesus? You know, based on the reaction of the battle-tested Roman centurion, I'm guessing that some of those men probably were terrified too. Look at what it says in Matthew chapter 27. I mean, we've, I think this is probably familiar to a lot of us. 
But Matthew chapter 27, verse 54, says, um, says this. When the centurion and those with him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and all that happened, they were terrified and exclaimed, surely he was the Son of God. Well, if these Jewish leaders were terrified, they really didn't show it, brothers and sisters. In fact, the chief priests and the Pharisees doubled down, and they instructed the Romans to guard Jesus' lifeless body. And while the Romans did that, the Jews seemed to go about doing business as usual, even when the veil to the Holy of Holies was in disarray. Now remember, you know, we're here to remember Jesus, and we think about you know, as we prepare to break bread and drink wine, we often read about the Last Supper when they were preparing for the Passover. Jesus died on Passover, which was the start of a seven-day-long feast of unleavened bread. This was a busy time for the Jewish hierarchy in Jerusalem. Included in this week-long festival was a harvest ritual, and it required the participation of the priests. We read about this harvest festival in Leviticus chapter 23. This is in the Law of Moses, and it was given to the nation as they prepared to leave slavery in Egypt and go into the Promised Land, that land that was flowing with milk and honey. I'm going to read from Leviticus chapter 23, and we're going to look at uh, verses 6 through 11. Leviticus 23, verse 6. On the fifteenth day of the month of the Lord's Feast of Unleavened Bread begins, for seven days you must eat bread made without yeast. On the first day, hold no sacred assembly and do no regular work. For seven days, present an offering made to the Lord by fire. And on the seventh day, hold a sacred assembly and do no regular work. So what we're reading about here is a seven-day-long feast of unleavened bread. And in the middle of this week-long festival, there was a harvest ritual and it required the participation of the priests. Verse 9, The Lord said to Moses, Speak to the Israelites, and say to them, When you enter the land I'm going to give you, and you reap its harvest, bring to the priest a sheaf of the first grain of the harvest. He is to wave the sheaf before the Lord, so it will be accepted on your behalf. The priest is to wave it on the day after the Sabbath. This is a Sunday. Verse 12. On the day you have the sheaf, you must sacrifice a burnt offering to the Lord, a lamb a year old without defect. So this ritual, brothers and sisters, took place in early springtime after the fields had been dormant and dead all winter long. You know, just as Sandy might get excited when the crocus begins to blossom in early spring, the people of Israel would get excited when the first of the barley crop would begin to grow and those dormant and dead fields began to come back to life. The day of first fruits is what we're reading about here in Leviticus chapter 23. It took place on a Sunday, the day after the weekly Sabbath, and the purpose of this ritual, the feast or the day of first fruits, the purpose of this ritual was to offer thanks to God for bringing the nation out of slavery to a land that was flowing with milk and honey a land where they could experience bountiful harvests. And when the priest lifted up 
this first of the barley offerings, this sheaf from the crop, it was to wave before God, to thank God, to acknowledge that God brought the land back to life again. And importantly, brothers and sisters, the ritual was also an expression of faith that the harvest of the rest of the crop would surely come later. This was, again, the first of the barley that propped up through the dead land. And by them acknowledging this and thanking God for this and waving this first fruits of the offering, it was as though they were showing that they had faith that the rest of the crops would also grow and be harvested. It was a way they could give thanks to God. So with that as background, let's turn our attention back to Jerusalem in the days following the death of Jesus. You know, I find it remarkable that with the wicked men who conspired to kill an innocent man could just three days later perform a religious ceremony before God as though nothing had happened. I mean, that's how wicked mankind's hearts can be. That mankind could put to death an innocent man and three days later appear before the God and creator of all mankind, the sustainer of life, having killed the life of an innocent man. These men could go and somehow think they were right in performing this religious ceremony. It was as though nothing had happened those three days before. And while Jesus' body lay in a tomb outside the city walls, what was happening this day in Jerusalem is that the Sanhedrin, the leaders of the Jews, were gathering a procession of people. The historians tell us this. The Mishnah speaks of this. Edersheim speaks of this. The, the leadership gathered a procession of people that would leave the city. And they would go outside of the city walls where they went to a field. And it was in this field that the first fruits from that first barley crop were harvested. Once the barley, that sheaf of barley, was gathered, it was put in baskets, and the people then marched back into the city, up to the temple with its torn veil, and there they would have presented the first fruits to the priest. Again, it was as though nothing had happened three days earlier. It was business as usual. But brothers and sisters, on the same day, that the priest waved that first fruit offering before God. Possibly at the very same moment that was taking place, Jesus' lifeless body began to stir while it was in the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. While this sheaf of grain the first fruit offering to God was being lifted and waved before God outside the city walls where this procession had just gone and come lay Jesus, dead and buried. And as the priest raised the first fruit offering, in my mind I see Jesus' body begin to stir. And the scripture tells us that he was raised to life again. On the first day of the week, Jesus was resurrected, brothers and sisters, on the day of first fruits. The Apostle Paul picks up on this in today's reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Turn with me there. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, we'll once again look at verse 20. 
But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. For as in Christ, all, for as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. But each in his own turn, Christ the first fruits. Just as the first sheaf of barley was to give the Jewish nation the confidence to know that additional crops would grow, the resurrection of Jesus, the first fruit, should give us, his followers, the confidence to believe that a future harvest of righteousness will take place at Jesus' coming. Verse 21. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. For as in Adam die, so also in Christ will all be made alive. So I think that that really addresses that first point of this parenthetical or this digression that Paul references, where he describes the first fruits. And we see through the law how Jesus was that greater first fruit. Not an offering of grain lifted before God, but as a sacrifice of his life before God. Lifted up on the cross and raised to life again. And this, brothers and sisters, gives us hope that we too will be raised. Paul then in this argument uses an interesting expression in verse 23. And he writes, he writes about the, uh, the coming resurrection as though it takes place in turns. Do you see that there in verse 23? But each in his own turn. The King James Version uses the expression in order. Now I thought this was interesting because... When I think of in turn or in order, it thinks, I, I think of it almost as a chronological thing, and that may be true. But what Greek scholars tell us is that word there for turn or order refers also to a military division, to a troop, or to a battalion. And when we read about what happens next in this section of verses, we're reading about those who are raised in Christ performing a very important duty. And it's during this, this period of a thousand years after the resurrection of the dead that those who have been baptized into Christ, those who have been raised, will go out to preach the good news to the nations, to teach the nations and to destroy all kingdoms so that the kingdom of God might instead be established. The role of the resurrected saints is described in verses 22 through 26. We'll just take a look at a couple of passages here where it says in verse 24, then the end will come when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father and he's destroyed all dominion, authority, and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. Now that might cause you to think, brothers and sisters, of that psalm that is quoted more than any other psalm. It's the Psalm 110. Here in Psalm 110, we read of the time when David is looking forward to God speaking to his Lord and saying, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. The Lord will extend your mighty scepter from Zion and you will rule in the midst of your enemies. Verse 3, your troops it's an echo to what we read here in 1 Corinthians about the order, the battalion, the troops. Your troops will be willing on your day of battle, arrayed in holy majesty. And what's the purpose? The purpose in verse 5, 
is that he will crush kings on the day of his wrath. He will judge the nations, heaping up the dead, crushing the rulers. Why? So that the kingdoms of men will be destroyed in favor of the kingdom of God. This is the very thing that Daniel speaks about. With a righteous king, the world will learn of Jesus and his ways. Let's look at Isaiah chapter 2. So on one hand, during that thousand year reign, the troops of Christ, those who have been raised to life again, will go out and they will destroy the kingdom of men. And on the other hand, they will go out and they will teach the nations of God and his ways. Isaiah chapter 2 verse 3 Many peoples will come and say, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways so that we may walk in his paths. And finally, brothers and sisters, sin and death will be a thing of the past. This is what we read about in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Again, this time in verse 24. Then the end will come when he hands over the kingdom to the Father after he's destroyed all dominion, authority, and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. And the last enemy to be destroyed is death. For he's put everything under his feet. One day, brothers and sisters, Jesus' mission will be fully accomplished. You thought about that? One day, Jesus' mission will be fully accomplished and the world will no longer need a mediator between God and man because all the earth will know of God. All the earth will have learned of his ways. Sin and death will be destroyed. And when that happens, God will establish direct communication with his perfected children. Once again, God and man will dwell together in a restored garden of perfection. And that's what it means when in 1 Corinthians 15, it speaks of God being all in all. When he's done this, then the Son himself will be made subject to him who put everything under him so that God will be. What a day when Christ looks out, having known what he accomplished in his 33 years of life, and thinks also of all that had been accomplished in the years since, working in our lives, returning to this earth, teaching the nations of his Father, so that finally, at the end, all the earth would be filled with his glory. His mission accomplished, he then gladly turns the kingdom over to his father. And until then, brothers and sisters, we come here to this place to remember our Lord, the first fruits of the coming harvest of righteousness. During this time of waiting, brothers and sisters, we like the barley crop on those parched winter lands, are sometimes buffeted by scorching heat or the winds that blow or the torrential storms of life. But in the end, brothers and sisters, we are promised a harvest of righteousness. So let's look forward to Christ's return to the resurrection of our family and our friends in Christ. Let's look forward to the coming kingdom, which will continue when God becomes all in all.